Hello, Mr. Teru again. Thank you for watching my videos. I do really, really appreciate it, and I hope they're, you're finding them to be helpful. Well, today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects in math, but it can also be one of the most frustrating, and that is word problems, modeling with functions. You know, this is really where you start to see some of this math get put into real life. And maybe not just everyone doing these type of problems, but someone whether you work at a corporation doing, you know, big, big projects, or an engineer, or if you're just a builder, uh, these word problems, you know, actually do have an application and a purpose for, you know, for some day-to-day -day life. Also, word problems, you know, we don't talk about in terms of X's and Y's. We don't use that language in real life. So, if you write an equation in plain language, you might notice that you actually do a lot more algebra than you really think in your everyday life. But let's be honest, a lot of it is just addition, subtraction, and a little bit of percents when you deal with money. Um, so these can be frustrating because we don't deal with them that often, and word problems are always hard to set up. But they are getting applied. All this algebra is getting applied to some degree of reality, which uh, can make things seem a bit complicated. So if you have a business, you'd like to be able to track and predict your, say, your um, revenues and your sales based on certain parameters that are already happening in your business. And let's take a look at that first with this first word problem. Um, I'm just sort of giving you the facts of the problem instead of writing a big long thing out and covering this whole board. Let's say that you're selling something right now and you're selling about 4,500 units at $50 a piece. Maybe these are concert tickets. Maybe these are just uh, something you're selling at an, an electronics store. Whatever. Uh, but you're selling 4,500 units of something, whether that's uh, per day, per week, per month, or something, but it's a set value or set amount, and it's $50 a piece. Now, whether uh, a statistician has helped you out, or maybe this is a survey from your customers, but we're thinking that if I raise this price, And so if I raise this price a dollar, so we're going to raise a dollar, if I do that, we expect to lose, not lose, lose five sales, or lose, a fi um, lose five sales or five units. So, we're going to use this information. We're selling 4,500 units of something, $50 a piece. If we raise that price by a dollar, for every dollar that we raise it, we're expecting to lose five sales or five units of sales. Uh, can we come up with a formula that would model that situation and then take another step further and set up a formula that would calculate our overall revenue? Well, let's just do one for the sales at the moment. The number that you're selling, based on the price, that it's going to be equals, now all your formulas like say carbon-14 dating from science, uh, carbon-14 dating, you know where they say you, you have something you found and it has a certain amount of carbon and then every so many years you lose half of it. Uh, or money in the bank, you start with a certain amount and hopefully every month that amount goes up. Of course nowadays it's going up really, really slowly. Uh, too slow, you might think. Uh, but formulas will generally start that uh, get applied to real life where you have this an initial value. Well, our initial value is our 4,500 units of sales. And we're expecting our sales to go down five every time we raise it by a dollar, you know, based on some kind of market research. So we're going to lose five units of sales for every dollar that we mark up the price. How do we bring that into this formula? Well, let's say we're selling it for 50. Let's say we sold it for 51. Well, wouldn't you just subtract five one time? And what if the item were $52? Well, $52 is $2 over 50, so you'd subtract 5 twice. Well, what if it was $55, the new price? Wouldn't you subtract $5 five times because you're $5 over? So I'm not really sure what goes in this formula, but I'm making up some examples, which you should be able to do with word problems, or should do, to help you see the pattern of what's going on. $51, we subtract this once. $52, we subtract this twice. $55, we're going to subtract this five times. Now, why, how's my brain coming up with those values? Or how might you be coming up with those values? Well, I'm subtracting. I'm subtracting the new price 
which I'm not using the variables of x and y to try and make this make more sense. I'm taking the new price and I'm subtracting it with the old price. So I can find how much is the increase. $55, the increase would be five bucks. Okay, now you subtract by five, five times. This is it. Our number of items sold is going to be based on the original 4,500 minus five times the difference of the new price to the old price. Because again, we're going to lose, we think we're going to lose five sales for every one dollar of increase, not every one dollar in the price. Now, if I clean this up a little bit, I'm going to have 4,500 time minus five times the price times five times 50 is going to be one negative. So negative times negative is positive. That parenthesis shouldn't be there anymore. Uh, 2250. Good. And then 4500 plus 250 is 4750. Good. Now, I'm using full words, but I know you're not going to see that in your textbook. So let's on the side say that X is going to be the price, the new price of the item. Well, now this becomes 5 times X. And this might look in a textbook like NX. See how kind of like you lose a lot of the context of what's going on when you just start using X's and Y's or function notation as opposed to actual real, you know, plain language like we actually use every day. So this is the number of items being sold based on our assumption that the initial sales were 4,500 and that every one dollar of increase in price we're going to use, lose five units of sales. Okay, so that's the number of items being sold. Now another common question in textbooks are, well, what's your total revenue? Well, let me make you this simple example. If I sold three items at $20 a piece, wouldn't that be $60? That would be revenue of 60. So revenue is simply how many you're selling times the price. Well, how many of these items are we selling? It's not 4,500. It's 4,500 minus 5 times the increase um, in the price. Or we just figured that out. This is how many items we're going to sell based on past sales and our new price. So the number is going to be 47.50 minus 5x. Times what? Well, if I kept it in plain language, I could have said the number sold times the price. But, you know, I know you're not going to see full-blown words in your math book. So this is the number of new items being sold with, based on the new price. And the X is the price. It's defined as the price of the item. So number sold times the price. Bam! There you go. Revenue. So if I distribute this X, we get 4750X minus 5X squared. Now, I'm going to kind of go off subject a little bit or expand this a bit more. I'll do these examples in two videos because I know I'm not going to fit all the ones I need in just one. If you were an economist or a businessman, you would care about this a lot. Okay? And you would want to be able to find out the maximum or the best price to sell your item and make the most money. No one cares about how many seats are in the football stands or really how many items you sell. It's all about the profit, the revenue coming in. Well, revenue and profit is not the same. Um, but you want to maximize your revenue to maximize ultimately your profit. Now, we're not doing this in my class, but if you wanted to re uh, maximize your revenue based on the cost of the item, you've got a perfect example and perfect situation where you can do this. Anything with an exponent of 2, just one exponent of 2 is a parabola. And this parabola has a leading coefficient as net, which is negative. So if you were to graph this with your graphing calculator, and this will be covered in my class somewhere else, or maybe in your math class, but, and I don't know exactly what this is going to look like, but I do know this is a downward, because the leading coefficient, the degree on the second degree term, did I just say degree? The leading coefficient of the second degree term is negative. So I know this is going to be a downward opening parabola. So if I were to graph it on a, um, on a calculator, I would get a parabola like this to some, somewhere. And I could use my parabola to find my relative 
maximum. And when I find that point, well, the x is the money. The y is uh, the revenue. Now, this is the price per item. And the y-axis is going to be revenue, so I can determine what would be the best price to sell my item to maximize my revenue. Maybe it's not $50, maybe it's $55 or $60. Um, you might even find out that you need to lower the price, but that would be outside the scope of this question, because lowering the price would give us a whole new different formula. Um, but there is an application for this if you're in economics, where you want to find the perfect price to maximize your revenue, and you can see that parabola happening here with the power of 2. So that's a little bit of expansion that you might do in a problem in other math classes. My students right now are not. We're just setting up the formulas. Okay, so let me see if I can get another example done before we get out of here. Okay, let's say that I want to build a box. And the box I'm going to build this is going to be an open box. I'm going to use a piece of cardboard that is 30 by 30. And how am I going to make this box? Well, I'm going to cut corners out of it. And every corner I'm going to cut the same length. And I'm going to come in and cut a length of X out. Okay, so there I've cut it out. And now, if I was actually making this box, wouldn't I have to fold up the sides? So we're going to have fold lines here, 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 and here. And I'm going to fold it up. I'm going to take these sides and fold them up, fold them up, and I'm going to get a box that looks like this. Bada bing, bada boom. And just to highlight the bottom, where these fold lines are, they're here. Okay, that's not my neatest box ever, but... And I want to write a formula that represents the volume of this box. Well, volume is length times width times height. Well, how long is this bottom of this box? That's this blue line. Now, my box, my cardboard was originally 30 inches wide, that I'm now going to make this box out of, but I'm going to do that by folding the sides up. Well, that's the length of x here. That's the length of x here. So this blue line is going to be 30 minus 2x. Like, say this is 2 inches, and this is 2 inches. Wouldn't the box then be 30, 28, 26? So I'm going to take this cardboard, cut little squares out of it. That's going to fold. When I fold, give me a length of 30 minus 2x. And then how deep is it? 30 minus 2x. And how tall are the sides of these boxes? Well, how much did you cut off the corners so you could fold the sides of this cardboard up? X. So now I've got a flat piece of cardboard with the corners being cut out, being folded up to make an open top box. And I can describe the volume of this box based on the fact that I've cut a certain amount out of each corner, all the same, and the original piece of cardboard or paper that I'm uh, working on is 30 by 30 inches. So, before my time runs out, the volume of this box in terms of x is length times width times height. You're going to foil all this together and get 900 minus 60x minus 60x plus 4x squared times x. And that's going to be 900 minus 120x plus 4x squared times x. And I'm not going to finish that last distributive. I got a formula in terms of x and these corners that I've cut out that will tell me the volume of this box I can make out of this piece of paper that's 30 by 30. Bam! Don't work on them word problems.